Uh, are you ready to get into the second uh, message of Victorious Secrets? Amen. Two of y'all. Uh, yeah, I guess I scared y'all last week. Today we're going to, last week we talked about uh, overcoming fear. And just just real quick deal with that. Fear is one of those things that, that gets in us and it deals with our emotions. It makes us see things in such a way that uh, it's not just that maybe may, may be hard, it may be tough to overcome, it may be one of those things that, uh, I don't know if I can do that. That's, that's doubt. We're going to talk about today. Fear cripples you. Fear makes you not, to, not even want to try. And what you're going to notice today is a lot of the same scriptures that I used last week we're going to use today because fear and doubt work hand in hand. One cannot work without the other. Just like, just like faith and trust have to work together, fear and doubt have to work together. And, and what you have to understand is when we talk about fear, fear grabs us on the inside and, and stops us in our tracks. But doubt is what comes out of our mouths when we stand against what we're supposed to be believing. So if you'll take your Bibles go to Proverbs. We're going to start at Proverbs uh, 3 and 5. We're going to start there. <clears throat> Actually, uh, I was reading this scripture this morning, and uh, then April brought it up in the team meeting, and then uh, I didn't realize, but she had been teaching on this on Tuesday nights. Uh, so it just kind of all worked together. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Now, that word understanding, now, I'm going to try my best not to get hung on a rabbit trail here, but that word... <laughs> Why are you laughing? That, that, that word understanding is the word reasoning. Lean not unto your own reasoning. Lean not unto your own way of figuring this thing out. Y'all can't figure this thing out. I love you, but you can't figure it out. I can't figure it out. We can't figure it out. We weren't designed to figure out our problems. We were designed to get in the word and find ourselves in there. And when you find yourself in the word, when you find yourself where you, you think that the Bible was written for you to find what you're dealing with and to learn how to walk out. Not, not, to, not to condemn you. People use the Bible to condemn people. People use the Bible to hurt people. Use people they use religion. They use all kinds of things. But you have to understand, when Paul was talking to Timothy, he said, fight the good fight of faith. Matter of fact, let's just read that. Go to 1 Timothy. I'm going to try not to get on these rabbit trails, I promise. But, hey, we're going to go where we go, right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, my shirt is trying to peek its head out. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter, <laughs> chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called, uh, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, stop right there. Let's dissect this sentence a minute. Fight the good fight of faith, comma. Which means there's something else. Lay hold on eternal life. The good fight of faith is not just getting saved. You know what a good fight is? Does anybody know what a good fight is? We ain't talking about a good fight where both people are bloody. Not them. We're talking about a good fight. The good fight is the fight that you win. The good fight is the fight that it's over before you start. The good fight is the fight that you know the outcome. And the problem is, is we do know the outcome. It's in the book. We just don't get in there enough to know where we are in it. And what we do is we think God can. And we think he will for other people. And for some reason, because we talked about last week, our fear, our fear makes us think he will for others, but he won't for us. And then we get to a place where doubt shows up. Now, doubt is one of these things. Doubt is the absence of trust. Doubt means to be unsettled, to be uncertain, to waver, and to be undecided. Now, Mark eleven twenty three 23 says this, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, we all got mountains in our life, right? Every one of y'all got mountains in your life. I know I do. Say to this mountain, mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt, where? In his heart, but believes in those things which he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. This is the breakdown of the faith movement. Because those of us who are word of faith, and those, those of you who don't know what word of faith is, we, we came up under Dad Hagen, Brother Copeland, those guys. That's who I came up under. Uh, Matt Gober was my spiritual dad. And the truth is, is we've learned how to migrate all this in here uh, and teach the word. But the truth is, when it says, to say unto this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart. 
we've gotten really good at saying words. You ever been around those? Now, now some of y'all may not ha- ever have, but some of us Word of Faith people, you've been around them fake folks that everything's faith. I mean everything. And, it, you know, and they smell something all the time. You know, they talking and Lord, you know, them people. You see them in Walmart. You talking about the banana? Come on, y'all. Listen, I hear from God, and you do too. And, and sometimes it ain't as dramatic as you think. As a matter of fact, the drama you put on it. Oh, Jesus. Listen, <laughs> some things are just learned behavior. They ain't the Holy Ghost. And, and we make the Holy Ghost look very stupid when he's a gentleman and a very kind individual. <clears throat> and he's full of wisdom and grace and knowledge. And if we would just settle into what he's saying... And learn to apply what he's saying to our life versus doing it our way. We are really good at telling somebody else's story. But God needs you to have your own story. He needs to, you need to break through some of your stuff before you start talking to everybody about how they need to break through some of theirs. It amazes me the amount of people that will do this. They will, they will speak to the mountain and they'll tell it to go to the sea. But you, if you, you don't know their heart because they're so false. God's trying to get us to a place where we don't doubt in our heart because it's doubt that stops what's next. You can break fear all day long. Now listen to me. We talked about fear last week. You can break fear all day long and you cannot be afraid. But if you don't put yourself in a situation to where you're overcoming doubt, fear, the breaking of fear will make you hard in the flesh. It'll make you where can't nobody tell you nothing. You ain't scared of nothing. Let me tell you something. You don't have to be scared to still have a healthy respect for the Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you all something about the Holy Ghost. He's my friend. And I pray in tongues every day. I don't care if you know it. And the truth is this. The Holy Spirit, people say, Pastor, you can't talk about the Holy Ghost. People get scared. We, we, we got The Walking Dead. <laughs> and we got movies where a girl is in love with a vampire and a wolf. And you're going to tell me common sense people scared of the thing that can heal them. Now, they're afraid of what they've been shown who he is, which is some of y'all fault. But who he is, is gentle and wonderful and kind. Our reaction to power, let me tell you something. You see people fall out and you see things. This ain't where I was going, but we go in there. You see people fall out under the Holy Ghost and you see movement and you see all that. And you say, well, I just don't know about all that. Listen, that is not, that is your body reacting to power. You ever seen anybody grab an open line? It ain't, it's funny, actually. <laughs> but, but I will say this. We have created entire church movements on thing that, things that were never the Holy Ghost. Amen. But I also will say when real power's happening, some things happen you don't understand. You have got to be discerning enough in your spirit to know what is what. Because we can go through all the calisthenics of church. We can, we can go through... Man, we can shout, we can jump, we can march, we can dance, we can throw our money at each other. I mean, I've been, in, y'all, I'm embarrassed to tell you this. I've been in movements where we believe in for debt freedom. We'll take our wallet out, throw it on the floor and stand on it. And God's like, what is, what is wrong with you? But, but it was a high, the music was high. You know, if you get the music high enough, you can get people just to do about anything. Church I trained in, Living Word Ministries, the Hortons aren't here today, but they could tell you. The church I trained in, Matt was there. Where's Matt? Matt's in the back, Christy. We, the church we came from, when they were like this tall, and I was training, man, Pastor Oldsby could preach on pizza as long as the music was high. That place would go nuts. And we'd be walking out talking about pepperoni, pepperoni. <laughs> I'm not lying. I am not lying, am I? I'm not lying. <laughs> you can move people with charisma, but I would rather move people with the Spirit of God. Now, that has nothing to do with my message today. I just want to say it. Now, (laughs) I don't know where I'm going to go now. Lord Jesus. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, let me just tell you all something. If you ain't got shoulders, you shouldn't be able to live. I'm just saying. (laughs) Some of y'all get that on the way home. And he said to the woman, Yea, God has said, "You you shall not eat. Of every tree in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God said you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it. Lest you die. Now. What was he doing? He was putting doubt. 
just a little bit of doubt. Satan messed up the entire garden with one sentence, one syllable, one moment. Because somebody listened to the wrong voice. You may have a heart full of faith. But if you spend a continual amount of time listening to the wrong voice, you will eventually start to believe like the loudest voice in your life. You are the sum total of the three loudest voices in your life. I don't care what you say, you are. If the Holy Spirit's one of those voices, amazing. But you are the sum total. And let me tell you how. You ever, you, have you ever seen, now I'm a dad, so I've seen this. One of, your, one of your children, as they get older, begin to date somebody. And one of two things begins to happen. That person begins to act like your child or your child begins to act like that person. It's called the law of attraction. One will become like the other because the loudest voice will win. And that's why the Bible says that you can't be, you, you shouldn't spend your um, emotional relationship with, and be unequally yoked. Because you should be equally yoked to God that his voice is the loudest in both people. That both people are willing to be molded and turned into who God is. Well, well, Pastor, you know, that's ideal. Let me just, don't, don't get condemned by that because me and April Bailey, would, neither one of us was saved when we've got together. I thought she was, I thought she was. She wasn't. She was, she, she had been hurt in church. I gave up on church. But then all of a sudden, the day came that God became the biggest voice in our life. And although we were both really loud and really dumb, we decided to do it his way. And, and, and watch him put our life back together. It wasn't easy. It wasn't one of those things that just happened. I believe in miracles, but I, I believe some things will take time. Because let me tell you something. God can turn anything around on a dime, but you still have to walk it out. Amen. I was in Adamsville Church of God at a prayer stone meeting when I got saved. And y'all know this story. And they brought me up to the front. I gave my life to Jesus. I tried to go sit down. They wouldn't let me. Uh, they put the camera in my face. I got mad. I cussed the prayer stone out in front of 500 people. Y'all know that. So then, uh, then the Holy Spirit moved on me. No man touched me. Y'all got to understand something. No man ever laid hands on me. The Holy Spirit moved on me. I hit the floor, and I didn't believe in this Pentecostal stuff. And I hit the floor, and I got up. Church was completely empty, and I was completely different. I haven't done any dope, hadn't, smoked, hadn't done all that since that time. However, I still have to walk it out. Every day, I have to maintain and learn and grow. There is no such thing as staying status quo with God. Every day he's trying to blow your mind with his revelation. Every day he's trying to get secrets into your life that you don't know yet. And, and we're, stuck on, we're stuck over here on milk and God's trying to pull us over on the stakes. And he's trying to get you to understand that he can change your life in an instant but you still have to move. But your only movement should be with him. When you walk with him, let me just tell y'all something. Well, you just don't understand who they are in my life. You don't understand how, how the hold they have. Pastor, you don't understand how loud their voice is. You start walking with the Holy Spirit close enough, they'll go. Because you will become strong and weird to them. Now, you won't be weird, but they will see things in you. Oh, I don't recognize that's not. Oh, you, you want them holy rollers. Call me what you want to, but I ain't rolling no more. Call me what you want to. There ain't no needle in my arm. Call me what you want to. I ain't smacking my wife around. Call me what you want to, but he's first. And they can talk about you all they want as long as you talk about him. Because he should be everything you trust in. Y'all, when you look up here and you see me teaching or whether any of our ministry friends are here, if April's up here teaching or anybody, you're seeing flesh, we are going to fail you. But if your eyes are on him, then when we mess up, you'll pray for us. Now, I'm tired. I'm, there, there's one thing in the church that I'm tired of. I am tired of watching churches shoot their own wounded. That doesn't make sense to me. We're supposed to be here to lift them up. We're supposed to be here to pray for people no matter where they find themselves. And it's almost like churches are looking for a reason to talk bad about somebody. And the truth is, is... <laughs> I'm off my notes. Let's just get real. The truth is, church folk are just as dirty as regular folk. We just learn how to hide it. We learn how to make it look holy. We learn how to talk to Christian ease. And there's no faith in it. It's full of doubt. It's full of shame because you sow what's in your heart. And if you're continually sowing doubt about a person, you are full of doubt in your heart. You don't believe what God's saying about your life. Now, we, this is something that I've had to learn. 
Because now I, I, I'm in ministry situations all the time where I've caught, I've found my, now I'm, I'm just real. So y'all, y'all judge me all you want to. You can deal with God outside. When I'm sitting at tables in the past with ministers and things would come up, I would be right in the mix running my mouth. And my wife will tell you that's the truth because I had to let the Lord correct me on that. Because I thought I had reached the upper echelon. And then one day I started listening. And I thought, you know, just a few years ago, that was me. Laying on that floor with the long hair and the Metallica shirt and smelling like pot and smoke crack before I got here. And we're sitting there laughing about pain. And it, something happened. Thankfully. And I said, you know, I don't care if we ever have a thousand people. I care if we have the right people. And that we get to help those people. That's what matters. It's about people, not crowds. And you have to help people through faith. Through teaching them not to doubt. First of all, they can't doubt their salvation. It amazes me the amount of people that get, get saved 17 times. You go to the right church and you offer a salvation message, same person hitting the altar every week. Now, we used to laugh about, but the truth is that's sad because somebody hasn't taken Tim to, to the side. So let me tell you something. It doesn't matter if you're per perfect or not. It only took one. Amen. Only took one. Now, they're, what they're doing is they're showing, I don't trust myself. Well, that's where we should minister to them where they are. And, and what we got to do is we get over into this. Now, look, I want you to see this. Go back, go back to verse 2 for me. Go back to verse 2. Let me, let me show you how this works. And the woman said unto the serpent, why is she talking to the thing causing her to doubt? Let me tell you something. Oh, here we go. Adam was the offspring of God. Eve was the offspring of Adam. Don't let your mind get in that in a human way. No, don't get in that because it'll mess you up. Adam, when he saw Eve, he saw bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, fell in love with her because he saw God in her. Y'all need to learn some of that. He fell in love with her not because she was pretty, but because she was godly. And all of a sudden, now listen, Adam, everybody says, well, where was Adam at when all this was going on? Adam was standing right there when this happened. Because Adam was watching to see if Eve was going to respond the way God would respond. Are y'all with me? Now, I'm fixing to give y'all a secret. Now, gathering folks, I've given to you this about 20 times. So we're going to get it again. Adam was the offspring of God. Eve was the offspring of Adam. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Fell in love with her. In the spirit and in the flesh, right? He was human, okay? So when Eve listens to the third voice, because God wasn't there, so the third voice was, this, was the serpent. When Eve listened to the third voice, she pulled herself out of the blessing, okay? Adam is still in the blessing, but he loved her. Adam did not fall. Listen to me. Go tell your Baptist preachers I said this and let them call me and cuss me out. It'll be fine. Adam did not fall. And if y'all don't think that happens, you're wrong. Adam made a choice to go get her. But he did it without consulting God. And the mean that he did it without consulting God, he pulled himself out of the blessing. And when he pulled himself out, God came and said, Adam, where are you? He didn't. Adam never addressed Eve. Now listen, this is deeper than I plan on getting, but y'all smart, let's go here. Adam never addressed Eve because Adam, I mean, God never addressed Eve because Adam covered her. Now men, God's talking to you about your house, not her. She shouldn't have to carry the spiritual weight. Now let's just leave that there. God spoke to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? And he tried to hide because all of a sudden, for the first time, he knew. He knew he was naked. See, before he was clothed in glory. Now, he loved her. Now, listen. He loved her. And he went to get her. But this is the mistake that every person makes every day. Is you choose to do things without talking to God. The continual fallen state isn't sin. It's the sin of not consulting if you'll get to the place that you go to, I don't care what it's about. 
Talk to him about everything. Talk to him about your career choices. Talk to him about your clothing choices. Talk to Lord, talk to him about your relationship choices. Talk to him about the people you put around you because the truth is you will become the loudest voice. They became the loudest voice because they didn't consult the right voice. Now, there's a whole lot in the Adam and Eve story I don't have time to get to. But when he went to get her, God said he had to now because they broke his law. But he's a father that with tears had his own sacrifice. And because they were afraid, listen, God didn't see them any different. But because they saw themselves different, he had a sacrifice of an animal and made them close himself. That is not a God who hates you. That's a God that meets you where you're at and knows he's got to get you back. But he's going to cover you until the time comes he can make it right. And if you can get to the place that you see him that way, it's easy to get up out of bed and thank God that you got feet to walk on. It's easy to get up. Listen, I, I, I love my family. I do. I love them with all my heart. I'm so grateful for the life that I get to live. But I'm not stupid. I know that even on my worst day, I'm here because of him. I, I, now, let me, let me just tell y'all something. I, I played music. I was a professional musician. Uh, I, was, I mean, I was high all the time. But, but I accomplished by the time, before I was 20 years old. Before I was 20 years old, I was on the road. I was traveling. I was about to go on tour with the Black Crows in two weeks from a record deal. I did that without Jesus because I believed in myself. What can we do believing in him? You can accomplish almost anything in you, in, on this planet in a human body if you put your mind to it, if you have no self-doubt. Well, let's get past self. And if you've got, but see, the problem is, is you're putting trust in people and things and you're not putting trust in him. But if you put trust in him, you begin to see the people and the things move away or come to you. Everybody, listen to me, everybody that comes into your life, listen, there is no gray area. Everybody that comes into your life came to bless you or to curse you. Everybody. I watch everybody that comes in the door of this church. Now, I love everybody. And I'm th I want, man, I want people to come on in. But I pay attention to everybody. I talk to the Lord. Now, who is this? Now, thankfully, most of the time, it's good. But there are those times. There are those times. I, I, April, and sometimes I don't see it. Sometimes I got people in this church that April, Miss Ann, Sherry, they'll pull me to the side and say, hey, you need to pay attention to this. Because I get too busy sometimes. But it's not that I don't doubt, listen, but I'm not focused. And when you're not focused, it's easy to get out of faith. See, faith has been taught about things. We're believing God for a plane. We're believing God for a car. We're believing God for a house. I'm believing God for children. I'm believing God for money. I'm believing God for a job. I'm believing God, believing God, believing God, believing God. Are you doubting or are you in faith? Because if you don't believe in God, why are you believing for his stuff? His stuff doesn't matter, and I've learned this. The closer I get to him, the more of his stuff shows up. Amen. See, I don't, I don't beat y'all up for offerings and tithes, and I don't do all that. I mean, the truth is, if, if, if you got that's between you and the Lord. And if I have to follow you home and live your life for you, then I'm focusing on you, not him. Are y'all with me? Because what we got to do is we got to really settle into not wavering, not being in doubt, not being unsure. There is nothing worse there's nothing worse than being unsure about something. It's awful. Women need security. Men don't. Man, listen. Let me tell you something about men, ladies, in case you don't know. All we need is something to eat and a TV. And we don't care about nothing. <laughs> Women, they got to have a nest. And we don't understand that until we start getting older in life. And I didn't understand that about April. And when I began to understand that, I started to understand how to put my faith in action, not just for the big things, but for the little things. The every day, where she didn't have to look at the bank account 17 times a day. I don't know why she did, because it ain't going to change. But she did. It, was, it, was, it, was, it had her. And she'll tell y'all, that's her story, not mine. But it wasn't her problem. The problem was with me. I'm believing God for gigantic ministry. And I'm not taking care of the day-to-day -day things that as a husband I have to do as her number one earthly priority in my life. She is my Eve. He was the first Adam. Jesus was the second Adam. Adam. 
let me mess with you a little bit. Jesus was the second Jesus. Adam was the first Jesus. Yo, quiet now. Who are you going with this? Hang on. When Jesus came, we're talking about the second Jesus. When he came, he wanted to cover you just like the first Jesus had to be covered. But he knew he had to cover you with himself. Because when he was baptized and God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That was the announcement that this man can cover man. And when man was covered in him, man began to get the opportunity to talk, walk, be, say, and act just like him. Now, let me just tell y'all something about arrogant Christians. Jesus wasn't arrogant. Jesus wasn't hard. Jesus wasn't tough. He wasn't mean. But he was manly. He was manly. He could handle his business. However, now, now look, let's just, let's just say this. We, we preach a lot about grace here. I preach a lot about love and Jesus loves you and grace is real. But there, there is a real opportunity for tables to be turned over too. Because Jesus did that as well. Which means he wasn't scared to put what God wanted back in order, back in order. And sometimes you got to turn some things over in your life to get back to the place where doubt disappears. When you get to the place that you know he's got you, it doesn't matter who else believes it. You have to believe it. There's one thing that was, I was told years ago and it stuck with me and it stuck with me and it has stuck with me and I'm going to tell it to you and you've heard it before. The minute God speaks to you, you stop asking what anybody else thinks. It don't matter what they think. But that's what ha I'll get phone calls. Pastor, this is what God said. What do you think? <laughs> How stupid do you think I am? I'm not going to speak against what God said. Now, what people don't understand, the nature of doubt is a sense knowledge and reasoning that uh, uh, contradicts God's word. Doubt comes to rob you. Abraham, let's just read it. Go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis 15. Are y'all okay? Y'all learned anything this morning? I'm trying to get back on track, but we're going to get there. Genesis 15 verse 2 says, But Abram <clears throat> said, Lord God, what will you give me? He, God had asked him to do something. You see, I go childless in the heir of my house, Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house as my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came saying, Now he was hearing God, okay? You, we should all be in a place where we're learning to hear God. This one, shall be your, this one shall not be your heir, which basically, uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But one who will come from your own body, say own body. Your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and he said, look toward the heaven, count the stars. Uh, and if you are able to number them, and he said, so shall be your descendants. Now, Genesis 16, 1 and 2. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me. Stop. You got to know what God says and what he don't say. And it's what she's saying sounds pretty spiritual. But the Lord has restrained me from having kids. That is not what happened. She had bought into that. Now, let's finish this story out. Let me just read it from the Bible so I don't mess it up. Restrain me from bringing, I pray thee, going into my maid, he's sending her into the maid, that I may be able to obtain children by her. And Abram, Abram, like an idiot, man, hearkened into the voice of Sarah. She sent him in to her servant to have kids. Now, if you understand, read the rest of the story. It was, it was those, now let me just tell you, this whole Islamic thing we're dealing with right now came from that story. Because it was a son born out of the word. There's ramifications in everything we do. Sarah hadn't bought into the fact that she could bear a child. Now listen. Let's, 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 let's deal with this. Now they're in there. Depending on which uh, theologian you want to listen to. They're anywhere from 85 to 115 at this point. And God said, Abraham. Your baby going to come from your body, which means that at the moment he spoke that, all the plumbing lined up. I mean, just, you know, praise the Lord. Y'all, hey, be weird if you want to, but that's what happened. 
Now listen, Abraham knew the word. And he knew that when God said it would come through your body, that Sarah, through covenant of marriage, is part of that body. But Sarah said, it ain't working. Let's do this this way. Now she had enough faith to believe that an 85 to 115 year old man could have kids. But she couldn't. You can believe anything you want to and pray for somebody else. How many of y'all can do that? Y'all can. Everybody can believe for everybody else way more than they can believe for themselves. Because they know who they are. They know where they've messed up. They know their failure. Sarah knew where her body was weak. She knew that, that the grind, the, the carrying of the baby, the daily, the nine months and the heat and things. She, and it, it aided her and aided her and aided her to the point that she had accepted that she will send her man to another woman to have a kid. You see what doubt will do to you? Doubt will make you believe a lie. And it'll make you settle into something. It will rob you from the very moment that God is trying to bless you. God is trying to get something into your life. And you try to reason it out to make it happen. Let me just give you an announcement. God never gave you a vision for you to make it happen. He gave you a vision for you to say it and watch it happen. You have to watch people come to you. I don't need church people. I need kingdom builders. I don't need people that will worship this church. I need people that will worship God. Because if we worship God together, amazing things can happen. When we get to the point that it's not about three songs in a sermon, but it's about what God is trying to do through us as a body, amazing things begin to break loose. And Sarah ended up having a child, but she had to have a visitation from God. Now, I believe you can have a visitation. But think about it this way. Because of her doubt, look at this, it may be, it may be, y'all reading that? She found it spiritual, and then she said, oh, it may be that I obtained a kid from the handmaid. It may be. In God, there is no maybe. If he spoke it to you, he's planned on it happening. The only delay is in you. Now, I don't want any condemnation in your life. I don't want you to get upset and, because, listen, we all have had to repent and fix some things, and we all have to do it daily. But this is what I want you to see. Doubt comes to discourage you. I'm going to give you a few things. You have to know that you have the mind of God on the situation. You have to know. If you don't know how to hear God, I want to I give you easy, easy. Well, I don't know if that was God, the devil, or if it was me. Let me just fix that. First of all, if the enemy, it's going to be against the word. If it's you, it has to do with your own gratification. If it's God, it's almost impossible. That's the easiest way I can lay it out. God will always tell you to do something that's not in your wheelhouse or something that you don't feel like you can accomplish on your own. Satan's always going to throw doubt in there. God's going to give you something that's going to cause you to pull yourself to another level. Now, you have to have the mind of God on the situation. You have to control your thought life. You know you can do that, right? You can control your thought life. April teaches it everywhere she goes. I learned this from her, not from Dad Hagen. I learned it from her. You cannot replace a thought with a thought. You have to replace a thought with a word. She was going through some things in her life, and she had postcards all over the house. And every time that she started thinking things she shouldn't think, she would read a postcard. I'm fearfully, wonderfully created. Fearfully, wonderfully made. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. I'm the apple of his eye. And you can't convince her different of that now because she changed her thought process by what was coming out of her mouth. Now, you believe what you believe because of what you said. Well, Pastor, I just don't believe that. Well, you've trained yourself for however many years to say those things, and that's what you believe now. But you have to learn to control your thought life. You have to hold fast to a proper confession. Resist doubt in Jesus' name. The only way to resist doubt is in Jesus you have to manage, uh oh, you have to manage your relationships. And you have to constantly give thanks to God for the right answer. Constantly. Don't fall into the trap of thinking one day you're going to arrive and it's just going to be easy. However, his burden is easy, his yoke is light. Your life on the outside can look like chaos. And you can stand in perfect peace and watch him make things happen for you. 
Doubt is a destroyer of a heart. When you doubt, listen, have you ever seen those people that they are so jealous of their spouse or so jealous over their spouse that, that it, you, you can't even talk? I mean, like, like you trying to have a conversation with them. They're watching their wife everywhere they go. I don't know about y'all, but I've been around them people. And it just amazes me, man. First of all, you, if you doubt her that much, that's a problem. But you doubt yourself. So somewhere in you, you ain't doing, you ain't doing, you're not taking care of her the right way. You're not treating her right, whatever it is, because now you have some kind of deficit where there's doubt in there. And let me just tell you something. Doubt is always internal in you, not because of somebody else. Because what we do is we blame. Well, it's because of this. It's because of that. And I, I'm just going to tell you, all I, I had, I've had over the years, several people come to me and talk to me about things in my life that I needed to to fix and repair and I'm teaching some things wrong. And I mean, I've been doing this over 20 years. You can't do it right the whole time. I mean, I've, I've had to grow. But I've always been open to it and I've always been, Lord, teach me. Because I have failed. Y'all looking at somebody who's failed. But listen, I have never failed with a wrong heart or intentionally. I failed because I did it Alan's way. And when you do it your way, it's because you doubt his voice. You don't know that that's what you're doing, but Satan is tricking you into that. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm sorry, Galatians, uh, Galatians 6 and verse 9 says this. Let us not grow weary while doing good. I'm reading New King James. Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Heart has everything to do with with doubt and faith. You believe God in your heart. You love God in your heart. You listen to God in your heart. You actually talk to God from your heart. None of it has to do with your brain. Your, brain, your brain's a mess. It is a mess. You are inundated. Men, you can't even buy uh, pistachios now without it have some kind of, of lust attached to it. Ladies, you can't, you can't turn on a TV show where a man is painted in a good light. How many of y'all seen a TV show where a dad's tr treated like he's got sense? It's because the enemy's trying to put doubt in how the system's supposed to work. Because if the head of the household is destroyed, the household's destroyed. Well, you just, I just don't believe that way. I'm a new age woman. Well, it'd be a new age woman. But the Bible still says the man's the head of the household. Which means, which means if you put yourself, now look, I ain't got time to get in the spirit of Jezebel. I got about two hours on Jezebel. Y'all hungry? Because Jezebel, listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. We're going to go there. Jezebel, we preach it as if Jezebel's a controlling woman. That's not what Jezebel is. Research it. The spirit of Jezebel means that you put yourself in the skin of something you're not. Jezebel covers people who try to be pastors that shouldn't be. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Jezebel covers, now see we, we hear that, she ain't nothing but Jezebel. Y'all get that out of your brain because the Bible talks about you clothe yourself in something that you're not. The spirit of Jezebel means that you're, you, you put yourself in a situation where you're believing or, or wrongly believing that you have some say about something God never told you to talk about. Uh oh, y'all real quiet. Now, let's go back to Adam because that's all lovey and stuff. Listen. Y'all got to know the whole Bible. You can't just know the good stuff. You got to know the real stuff. I mean, sometimes I don't like pickles, but every once in a while I get one on a burger and it crunches. I mean, it's there. You got to eat it. Listen, <laughs> you have to, if we faint not, how do you faint not? You faint not by knowing what he said. How do you know what he said? You spend time with him. Amen. I've spent time with Tyler. Somebody tells me Tyler says something outside of the realm of what I know he would say. I know, oh, whoa. That's either, either he's listening to a wrong influencer or Tyler didn't say that. It's because we know each other. See, when you get intimate with God, and I mean down and dirty. Listen, can I just tell y'all something? Y'all quit trying to hide stuff from God. You know he sees it. Get it out, man. Just go get somewhere quiet in the woods and scream it and get, just deal with it. And let him start talking to you about where you are. Because when you realize that you're not as far away from him as you think. And your life can turn around with a breath. But that breath has to be a breath of faith. That he loves you where you're at. 
no matter what you've clothed yourself in, no matter where you found yourself, no matter what voices you've listened to, let us not grow weary. Don't get tired of doing the right thing. <laughs>